Knock, knock. Who's there? It's Chris. Chris, welcome to the show, my friend. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Um, how are you? I, I'm doing great, and I'm sorry for the long lag in the beginning. I totally spaced on knock knock jokes. My son's too, so we don't we haven't reached that phase of of entertainment yet. Well, here we are. Here we are learning uh, learning new uh, new jokes and new intros along the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, listen, everyone tuning in today, welcome to you as well, the listener. I uh, appreciate that that's what makes the world of podcasting go round. So thank you for being here and tuning in again. Chris is joining me today, and we're going to be having a conversation about nutrition. For you regular listeners, you would have heard me speak to Danielle uh, a few months back, and we really digged into the facts of nutrition and kind of put it out there, dispelled some myths. And myself and Chris connected a while back. We actually chatted on my other podcast and we had a great connection. Uh, it started with audiobooks and coffee, and then it kind of went down many rabbit holes of other connection, parenting, health and fitness, nutrition. Um, and I knew this was going to be a great conversation to have, so I wanted to chat to you again. Uh, look, we're going we're gonna to dive into being busy parents. We're going to talk from experience today, and we're also going to align that with facts and Chris's incredible take on nutrition you know using those facts but that also the the playfulness of it the the way that you know you bring it all together through your kind of social media and you know through the messaging that you put out there which i really love and i really appreciate so i think we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a great chat and it's gonna benefit everyone tuning in today so i guess let's start with a little bit of uh, we'll, we'll do a little uh, a brief summary of uh, of kind of Chris and your background. So if you want to just yeah. share with us kind of how you got into the world of nutrition coaching and where it's yeah. kind of taken you on your journey. Yeah, great, great. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I've been a I've been a trainer and coach now for probably close to eleven years, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, I I it's, when I first entered the world as a trainer, um, and I'm using the they, we can use coach or trainer interchangeably. Uh, I like to think of a coach as someone who kind of takes the full scope spectrum, looking outside of the gym too, also looking at stressors within your life and your recovery and all of these things. That's just how I differentiate between the two. When I first became a trainer, I knew absolutely nothing, nothing about training, nothing about nutrition, nothing. All I knew was what was in men's health and men's fitness magazines and and the bodybuilder stuff that, that was just passed around uh, as a young uh male what i was consuming and when i first started to learn a little more about nutrition it was kind of the realm of all right you eat these foods you're not allowed to eat these foods um it it you know uh what's it fat burns in the flame of a candle so you need to be exercising every day so that you can do this and if you eat this food then you know you're right or wrong and you know, I, I can remember handing out a, a printed uh, eat this food, don't eat this food list. And, you know, ironically, we were talking about precision nutrition before we got on the call. And it was a list that they used to have that you could give your clients so they could be better informed. Make sure you're eating grass fed X or Y. Make sure you're having this. Make sure you're having this. And what it actually did is I found a lot of my clients would come back and say, I tried grass fed beef and it tasted like shoe leather. Is it OK if I eat regular beef. And my response was, no, you really shouldn't be doing that because you have to consider X or Y. I, I wasn't informed enough. I was also 23 at the time. I, I wanted to just seem like I knew more and it kind of proceeded to be that way for a while. And then about 2027, 20, so I, I became certified as a precision nutrition coach in, in 2013. And about like 2016, 2017, I got the opportunity to go through precision nutrition level two. And in that course, the, the way it is, it's a year long mentorship and you go through. And in that process, I learned way more about, uh, there's more to it. Nutrition, nutrition is a science. It's relatively a baby science. It's, it's not. And I, I mean this in terms of like, it is a new science, like relative compared to all the other things we've studied. And there's always new things coming out. We're always discovering new things about it. I mean, if you think about it, in the 50s and 60s, exercise was considered to possibly cause cancer because of the stress and inflammation it would put in your body. They told you that smoking was good for you and exercise was bad for you. So we have come a long way in the last 
you know, 50, 60, 70 years, and we're still learning things. That's the beautiful thing about it. We really can't be wrapped up in the idea that one way is the best way for every single individual. And I had mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm truly a nutritional agnostic. I don't believe any specific diet is better than the other one because what works for one person is going to work for another person. And I've just come to find that there's so much more wrapped into what you're doing with your nutrition than just calories in versus calories out. If on your previous podcast, I'm sure this topic came up, calories in, calories out, literally what it boils down to is the calories you are consuming is determining whether you're in a cal calorie surplus or a calorie deficit, or you're at maintenance. If we're at maintenance, you'll stay at the same size. If you're at a calorie surplus, you'll probably gain weight. If you're in a calorie deficit, you'll probably lose weight. That's what it is. And the only way to do either one is to do either one. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no hormone imbalances. There's no metabolism slowing down. There's none of that stuff. It's, it's really easy to get wrapped up in that, though, because it's, it's not what you want to hear sometimes. Yeah. You know, they even had... You know, they even had research come out and say and show that it's not your metabolism that slows down as you get older. It's the fact you're doing less as you get older. And that's okay. You know, that's completely normal. Uh, I, you know, I take a certain step amount of steps every day right now. When I'm like 75, will I probably still be cranking out like above 10,000 steps a day? The hope is, I hope so. But the likelihood is, I have no idea. So we have to understand that everything is relative. There's so much more that goes into this than just simply saying calories in versus calories out. But really, at the end of the day, calorie deficits work, calorie surplus work, calorie maintenance, it all works. It's just dependent upon what you're aware of and your emotional regulation. Those all play in because we have to look at our stress, our recovery, our socioeconomic positioning, our home life. Our, our, our emotional regulation, our fitness, like there's so many things that come into what, what is actually at the end result. So nutrition is only a small piece of the puzzle, but it's a big piece. Yeah. I hope that, I hope that answers your question. It did. It did. It gave everyone a, a real clear picture and actually made me think about some, some other stuff as well. So I, I always love that hearing a little, a little deeper about that journey and your kind of philosophy. I, there's many, many things to dive into, but you mentioned some really important things. And I'd love by to kind of start by tying in the role of being a human being, but specifically to us and to, you know, everyone tuning in and a large part of our audience and definitely who, who we as a business at the Knock Academy serve, which is busy parents. And, you know, we always use that term busy parents because... <laughs> There isn't a parent that isn't busy um, <laughs> juggling everything. And, you know, and I, I think sometimes I like to use it because people can sometimes see it as a negative, but we try and lean into that being a positive. Like it is busy and you're doing a great job juggling everything. Let's try and make those things a little bit easier to juggle and look at the priorities and, and nutrition being one of those things for us as individuals, as parents, but also because of the role we play in our kids' lives and being a role model to them. So there's many factors and, and I'm going to pull out a few things. Firstly, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on the, I guess, the, you know, you mentioned kind of like, you know, the, the social pressure, the, you know, the economy pressure, you know, there's a lot of inflation around food right now and, you know, things are going up. I noticed the other day, someone, someone posted something that the price of Oreos has doubled, which is oh, frankly horrifying because. Oreos are delicious. Um, but there's all these things that are going up and, and I'd love to kind of hear your, your take on that. And maybe when, you know, you're working with your clients is how are you managing those pressures and what are maybe some of the, the steps and the skills you help your clients with to, to navigate it? Oh, I love this question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, I think the big thing we have to look at here, and this is like a huge umbrella topic, but it, it really kind of is like the the culture that you and I have been a part of, however long your training career has been, you've seen it come and go in waves. And it's this idea of diet culture, right? We might have talked about it on the other podcast, but like diet culture in and of itself is the idea that if we really are entrenched in it, like at the far end of it, that we have to eat, uh, eat clean, eat healthy, eat, eat all organic, eat, 
eat all of these things, eat grass fed, eat all this stuff if we truly want to be healthy. There are a lot of influencers out there who promote specific things. They'll say things like, ah, take athletic greens. If you want to be really healthy, it has all the servings you need for a daily. It's a bunch of BS. And they also get paid to say that. And also they get kickbacks when someone buys with their promo code for the rest of that person's subscription, that person still gets a kickback. So it's like one of the only companies that does that, which is really cool for that influencer earning money. And I, that's a different topic in and of itself. But what we have to be aware of is that there's a lot of fear mongering that goes on surrounding specific things. I put a post up the other day, I think it was last night. And it basically said, I think diet soda is delicious. I drink it. I drink it because I enjoy things that taste good. I'm type one diabetic. It does not spike my blood sugar. It does not cause insulin resistance. It does not cause me to get cancer. The research is out there and none of those things are supported. Like none of those things are true. Like you will not get, technically, look, I, you will not get cancer if you're having aspartame or any of these or, or natural sweetener or whatever you want. But there are people who will latch on to this idea and they'll say, if you're not eating, if you're, if you're consuming this, then you are going to have X or Y. Uh, a particular person, Dr. Mark Hyman, he said that the body is tricked into believing you're consuming sugar and your body will increase the amount of insulin, leading to insulin resistance, leading to X or Y. That's not true. He just made it up. He literally made it up. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist, but I am someone who does read nutritional research and I do do my due diligence before I make any claim. Or if someone asks me a question, I'll go and look this information up before I give a reply like this. But because this person has like a million followers, let's say, and they write New York Times bestselling books and people will pick that up and will believe, okay, what he's saying is true. It's fact. Or they'll take a piece of research, pick out one little piece and say that it's fact when in fact, they're usually the bulk of the research actually disproves what they're claiming is a, is a fact. So this is a long way of me saying you don't have to eat organic or grass fed or any of these things to be inherently healthy. What marks someone as healthy technically, if we want to look at weight or weight ma management, is someone who is not at the higher end of the weight spectrum. It's, that's, that's really what it is. And how do we do that? Being in a caloric deficit, eating at maintenance, going for daily walks, strength training, drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, having meaningful social interaction and connection. All of those things are your biohack or your hack for living within a healthy realm. That's, that's, that's the truth of it. And look, financially, like there's different burdens on different people. However, going for a walk has no cost, even if it's five minutes. I know everyone has a different life. And I'm very privileged that, you know, we have childcare, we, we have jobs, we, we have a schedule. My, I, my life revolves around nutrition and fitness, and I never try to impose that on someone else's life or any of my clients' life. What I try to help them understand is that fi a five-minute walk is amazing for your mental health, for your clarity, for your daily total step count, which helps with your total energy, and energy expenditure. Like all of that stuff, it, it matters. It matters. So from a financial point of view, you can buy food, fruits and vegetables that are frozen. They don't have to be organic. In fact, they're some of the freshest produce because as soon as it's picked, it's frozen. We eat a majority of frozen fruit because my son and I and my wife, we eat a lot of fruit. I eat so much fruit. It's like my go-to snack. It's a thing I love. Um, so we buy a lot of frozen stuff. It saves a lot of money. And especially if you're buying the store brand, you don't have to buy like a fancy brand. You can buy the store brand. Um, frozen, frozen vegetables, same thing. You can, you can buy that. It's a convenience. It's easy. Um, you don't have, to, look, you can buy organic if you want to, if it makes you feel better. I'm not talking literally like health wise. I'm talking like emotionally, if it makes you feel better saying you're buying organic, great. But the research is out there, organic food, they still use, 
they still use pesticides on. They just happen to be organic pesticides. Like it's, there's still pesticides. You still have to wash your food, you know? So in essence, you don't have to do that. It's not going to make you better or worse. In fact, more people are likely to not eat fruits and vegetables because they're under the belief that if it isn't organic, they can't, they can't afford it. So they're going to eat other alternatives. What we want is to encourage someone to, to try fruits and vegetables. So saying or putting a label on the fact that you need to eat organic limits a lot of people. And that's completely unfair. So the people who are perhaps in those research papers and studies showing that, yes, their likelihood of cancer, heart disease, stroke, all-cause mortality is increasing because they're not eating organic. Yeah, it's because they're usually in a financial situation where they can't afford to eat those things. They don't have the perhaps education or understanding or, or information to know that it's okay if they're not eating organic. It's okay if they're eating McDonald's so long as they, maybe they order the salad off the menu. Maybe they look at a few different menu options. Like there, there's all that information out there. But when someone's trying to struggle to feed their family and to make sure their kids are okay, being told that X or Y is better or worse doesn't actually help them. They're going for the convenient thing that's going to keep everyone alive and fed. So we need to have that understanding. Um, that's usually how the conversation or the, the topic that is an umbrella topic I also believe that you can buy, if it's in your financial means, buy things that are pre-cut if it's going to encourage the likelihood of you actually eating it. Preparing your food at home, if you look at the cost, if the cost of groceries has gone up, what do you think has happened to the cost of eating out? That's also increased too. Um, you can look at buying prepared food within the store. Again, it's convenient. It's easier. If it gets you to eat or bring your lunch, do it if you can't afford it. You could buy frozen meals. You could, check out, you could check out a meal delivery service that perhaps they're, they're preparing everything. And again, yes, that does cost money. But if you weigh the cost, if your meals are prepared, then you don't have to spend as much money grocery shopping. So it actually winds up costing the same. So there are all these labels around what's better or what's worse. In actuality, what it is, is what works within your life? What works within your financial means? What can we actually do? I don't know... If up north by you, they have this. We have this store called Trader Joe's. Everything is store brand. Everything's ridiculously cheap compared to something like a Whole Foods or a, or even like a Stop and Shop. Like those things are, those places are expensive. Um, and there are like Instagram accounts where it's like uh, five minute meals with stuff from Trader Joe's. And literally it takes you five minutes. The cost per meal is something like, like it turns out for serving size, turns out to be like three or four bucks. So it's like, oh, there are all these resources and all these options at your fingertips. I would never tell someone they're bad for, for doing any of those things. I hope that answered your question. It did. It was, it, it was way more than, than um, it, way more information that, you know, that I was even hoping for. And it's so many great points that I know will resonate with so many people. It's so true that it, it's that whole thing in coaching, you know, and you, you <laughs> You mentioned how long I've been coaching. I really am a dinosaur. 22 years in August. Um, <laughs> so it, I've been around a while, but one thing I've always come back to a lot in coaching and everything, every time I do a certification or I have a conversation or, you know, I, I try and upskill myself, I always come back around to meeting the client, whoever you refer to them as your clients, your members, the people you work with, meeting them where they're at. Because it's so, so difficult to make lasting changes when you're overwhelmed, period. There's no discussion other than that one. It's difficult for anybody and anyone who's ever made a change in anything will know that. It just gets overwhelming. And so many of those points, Chris, that you shared are so valuable because it, it really is talking to that meeting people where they're at. You know, I've had clients, in, same as you, I've had clients in the past that are like, well, I feel like I need to give up this. You know, I, you know, I had a really bad weekend because I had this, this, and this, or I have to stop eating, you know, let's just say they went and got fast food. I'm like, no, you don't. I'm like, I can help you make some better choices when you go there, if you like, if that's something that, you know, will encourage that, that change for you, right. Or making that just being aware, like you said, it's not, we're not, we're not taking stuff out. And, and I've done it as well. Like as an early coach, it was all about, 
remove this, remove this, remove this, right? It's what can we, and it's, you know, the, the mentality around losing, we're going to lose weight. We're going to lose fat. I'm like, it's just the mindset of that. But like, what are we going to gain? What are we going to gain? Yeah. What can we improve? And, you know, what we can maybe build on? And, and, and that's so powerful. I love that about, you know, meals from Trader Joe's, like the five, you know, five minute quick meals and, you know, how to do it cost effectively. Like those things are yeah. so powerful. What, what I've come to find is, and look, if we're going to speak specific, if we're speaking on someone who wants to gain weight, whether that be like they want to put on muscle or thing, they're in a different situation. Usually you can get away with eating more. Um, ideally it's nutrient dense food. Um, when I did it, when I was in college, I ate everything and anything in sight. And I was eating like 4,000 calories a day. Uh, that was incredibly, it was easy for me to do. Cause I was, uh, I was 19, 20. Could I do that now? Absolutely not. Like I could, I could in essence, probably would it be enjoyable? Probably not. Um, we have to look at the reality of what it is to like lose weight or gain weight. There's like levels to it, right? We have easy, medium, and hard just to break it down. So easy would be like half a pound to a pound per week weight lost. Medium would be like one to two pounds a week. Hard would be like two to three pounds per week. If you lost like a pound a week, that would be like 52 pounds in a year. Uh, that's pretty ridiculous, right? Like that, that's ridiculous. No one's going to, like you will do it. However, it might take someone longer, right? Did I do that math right? I think I did. Yep. Pound a week, 52 yeah. weeks. Yep. Spot on. Yep. So like, so right, if we did that, if, if you, and it keeps continuing to go up, what people overlook is that I would rather have someone lose like half a pound because you're more likely to be able to sustain or adhere to whatever plan you're on and more likely to be able to develop self-compassion along the way. If someone has a lot of weight to lose, like let's say they want to lose like 150 pounds, 200 pounds, they can get away with doing a more drastic caloric deficit because a, a drastic caloric deficit for them might be eating like 2,500 calories. Yeah. That's, that's still a substantial amount of calories they can consume. And what happens is they'll lose weight really, really fast. And then like everyone else, they'll hit a plateau. And then what will happen is the person goes, okay, I have to cut my calories again or do X or Y again. Anyone in, in any size or shape will do this. It's just the way the mind goes. I need to eat less. I need to eat less. I need to eat less. This isn't happening fast enough. This isn't happening fast enough. But in the reality is you, you, you have to stick with what you're doing um, with a consistency. And if we continue to drastically lower calories, let's say anywhere from 250 calories to 500 calories over the course of every, every two or three weeks, you're going to continue to still hit plateaus. So what are you going to end up doing? Eating absolutely nothing at all. And then you're going to overly restrict. And then you're going to probably binge. And then you're probably going to feel really bad. And then you're going to think that if I just do a different diet, I'll fix everything. And then you'll do another diet. It's, it's a diet cycle. And the way we break out of that is by recognizing that it's not about doing the drastic thing. It's about doing the thing that's going to lead to long-term change, to uh, sustainable change. And that doesn't sound sexy, but that's why when we talk about like a client, like you gave, like they had, they had takeout on the weekend. Cool. It's Monday. You try again. And takeout's not a bad thing. If you want to look at it this way, whatever your deficit is, multiply that number times seven. That's how many calories technically you need to eat for the week to be in your deficit. If on one day you ate a little less and then you had takeout on another day, chances are you might still be in your deficit depending on how much you ate. If the scale goes up, it's usually because you're holding on to water, you haven't pooped. Maybe you exercised, maybe you drank extra water, maybe you drank uh, uh, more beer and had more carbs and you're generally eating lower carb during the week. Well, your muscles are absorbing water and glycogen. Literally, if you take, if you take a slice of bread and you stick it on water, what's it do? It absorbs the water like a sponge. Carbo, hydrate, hydrate. There's water in it. That, that's what it is. And if you give yourself about two to three days, it evens out, you know, um, Mike, Mike Dola, the owner of Stronger You Nutrition, he likes to say that it's borrowed weight, 
Like it's borrowed weight. And it, it is because it evens out. It, it yeah. really does. And drastic things tend not to work out well. They just don't. They don't. Yeah, it's the, uh, you know, you mentioned diet culture earlier and it's where everyone, everyone literally, I mean, based on the, the size of the, you know, the, the industry and how much money it generates, we've, we've all been conned at some point or another by the, the instant gratification over the consistent things, right? It's so, it, and it's everything we do. It's nutrition, it's weight loss, it's finances, yeah. it's everything in life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, at, at, at 20, maybe I was like 23, 24, uh, the big thing at the time was paleo, like going paleo. Cause we're supposed to eat like our ancestors, even though we don't really know what they ate. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that aware of it. Um, also we tend to live a lot longer than those folks, uh, because we, uh, are more sustainable, but I, I remember doing that and like, we ate no pasta. We ate no bagels. We ate no anything from a can. Like it was super intense and sounds horrible. I got, I got really, really shredded. Um, my wife, who was my fiance at the time, got really, really lean. Um, I was hungry all the time. I, but I looked really, really lean. Uh, and then in a couple months in my sleep was messed up. Um, there was definitely like hormonal imbalance. I, my, my sex drive was down, like plummeted. Um, my ability to recover between training sessions bonked, like all of these things that I was doing something that was quote unquote healthy, but suddenly all of my biomarkers were telling me, dude, what are you doing? And I'll tell you, the only reason I did it was because everyone at the gym told, was, was doing it and told me I should probably do it and I would be healthier if I did it. I read a book called Deep Nutrition. And in that book, it laid out how like there are people in tribes in Africa who like drink blood and eat every part of the animal. And at 60 years old, they look like they're 35. And I was like, that's cool. That's great. That's what they've been doing for thousands of years. Why? <laughs> Why am I thinking that's what I'm supposed to be doing? And it's because we're easily led astray because we believe that if we're doing what everyone else is doing, then we'll definitely be better. Um, it doesn't matter what size you are. If you can't recognize what's at the core of why you're making all the decisions you're making, you know, that's, that's the bigger thing. That's why I talked about emotional regulation. It's like, what are you actually trying to accomplish? Why are these things happening? Why are they repeating? You know, there's, there's a lot of that go that goes into all of these different uh, conversations. Yeah. It's, uh, it's looking for the, looking for everything that you put on your plate and put in your mouth as being the answer to everything. Whereas actually, if you just, for the, for the most part, if I don't know, I'm going to put a stab in the dark number, but I'd say 90% of people looking for a change in whether it's weight gain, weight loss, health improvements from their nutrition, if they left everything the same in regards to what they actually physically consumed and worked on the other stuff, 90% of them would change in the way they wanted just by looking at why they were eating when they were eating, how they felt when they were eating, right? Like the systems they had in place around it without changing yeah. anything else. Yeah, a, a lot of it is, you know, so there are two guiding principles, um, and this is this was brought to my attention by Josh Ellis. He's awesome. For those of you who don't know who he is, he is a he is a a weight loss coach. He specifically deals with emotional eating um, and emotional regulation, um, and he borrows a lot from psychology, uh, specifically um, acceptance and commitment therapy and therapies along those natures. Um, and he has a book that's called Lean and Strong. And it's called Eating Skills, Psychology, and Workouts. And it's, it's, it's like a textbook. It's amazing. I suggest all coaches have it on their shelf. Um, because usually, usually, we, we put things in a toolbox. If you've ever worked with a nutrition coach before, there's a bigger chance that usually they've just given you your macros. And your macros, I know you probably covered this on your previous podcast, but macronutrients are just 
protein, carbs, fat in grams, how much you should be having per day, and then your total calorie, uh, calorie, whatever that number would be for whatever particular goal you have, right? They might just give you that and then, and then tell you, you have to stick to that number. And if you don't do it, you're doing something wrong and X or Y. But what, what's really missing from a lot of coaches, and it's usually what has always been recommended to me, which is why I'm fortunate by other coaches that I've been mentored by or talked with, is having a better understanding of emotional skills, a better understanding of uh, the psychology behind why someone is making specific choices. One of the best books that a coach can read is Motivational Interviewing in Nutrition and Fitness. Motivational interviewing is a specific style of coaching where you are basically asking and listening to, for questions to be asking. Like it, it, it's neither good nor bad. It's just letting the person get to the to reason why they're choosing what they're choosing and helping guide them in the direction that takes them towards whatever goal they particularly might want to have. And in in Josh's book, what he talks about is there are like eating skills and skills are the things that we're trying to work on internally, right? And then there are guidelines. Guidelines are things that we might try to enhance those skills that need to happen internally. The number one problem people run into when they are trying to lose weight is they set or create a set of diet rules. Diet rules are, if we use the example of, of ketogenic diet, right? Keto, which is basically Atkins diet, which is basically not actually what a ketogenic diet is supposed to be used for, but that's regardless, um, not, not here or there. Um, in that, if I eat a bagel, that is bad because I am no longer in ketosis. I have eaten a carb. I am bad because I've eaten, right? That's a food rule. That's a diet rule. Generally, the more you're using diet rules, the more likely you are to backslide or to fall off or to start beating yourself up and you are to damage your relationship with food in and of itself. It's not that any of these diets are inherently bad. It's the people who promote them and say that there are rules in order to be successful, right? You, you, the, the rules are the thing that they usually end up breaking us down. So that's why I like guidelines. I like it as in like, this is, this is meant to fit your life. If, if you have to wake up at 3 a.m. so you can measure out the perfect amount of macronutrients so that you hit this window and that you enter ketosis properly so you don't – what do you – if you have kids, there's no way in hell you're doing that. There's no way. There's just no way. Like one of the guidelines that, that I'll use a lot with folks, and this comes from like a more mindful eating approach, is putting your forks down between bites. It gives you a chance to chew, slow down, enjoy the food, be able to recognize when you're getting full, stop eating. But if you have like a toddler, good luck with that, <laughs> right? So yeah. why would I, 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 we could talk about it, right? There are different avenues, right? It might be take a bite of your food, drink your water in between bites. So you give your chance a slowdown. You can still hold on to your fork or wait until you swallowed the bite in your mouth before you take another bite or Make sure you're basically eating a balanced plate. So even if you eat that plate, it has the proper amount of protein, carbs, fat, fruits, veggies on it. So you're actually full. And then because you're being engaged with what's going on, right? Talking with your kid, being engaged, making sure that, that the floor is not on fire because they've spilt something everywhere, right? You're less likely to actually be hungry anyway, because you're getting involved with what's going on instead of staring at the food that's all around you if you finish your plate of food, right? So it's like for like people who work shifts, if they are eating balanced plates, snacking is usually not going to be their problem anyway because they've eaten that balanced plate. But if they don't eat a balanced plate and they eat like a bag of chips and that's what they eat during their mealtime, then yeah, they're going to snack. They're going to have a harder time. Telling them to put their forks down, telling a doctor or a nurse to put their forks down when they're rushing between, between people they're seeing, that doesn't work. I worked with the first responder and it was like, yeah, I don't really have time to do that. So it's like, okay, yeah, for you, slamming a protein shake when you first get into the firehouse is probably going to work better for you than sitting down and having a meal with everyone. Being able to structure snacks, having, having protein bars that you can take with you and a banana or a piece of fruit that you can take with you on the, on the fire engine is probably going to be a better choice for you than me saying, ah, oh, you have to eat like within this eating that doesn't work for everyone. 
So that's why it's a guideline. They're meant to be adjusted and you're meant to try them. You're meant to make a ton of mistakes. You're meant to learn from each mistake and then make progress. That's what we're working toward is being human. Diet, diets, like diet culture diets, because diets do work. You will lose weight if you go on a diet. It's your ability to sustain that or learn how to regulate and do all these things that they don't usually teach you. Um, so the two big skills that everyone, if they worked on, they would make a lot of progress is during meals, recognizing when you're getting full and stop eating. And between meals, being able to distinguish between hunger versus boredom, being tired, or any other emotion. Those are the things that people really struggle with. So if we look like we'll work on guidelines and we'll also, depending on the skill level of the person, we might incorporate macros. We might incorporate calorie counting. It depends. It really, it truly depends. If someone does not have the foundation for those skills, I will have us do some form of tracking, but you're not going to be counting calories or doing anything. We'll track, we'll track consistency. We'll track steps. Well, we might keep a food log, but more so we can see when you're eating and why you're eating, as opposed to saying, okay, you had 110, you had 110 grams of carbs today. Someone's not probably ready for that yet. If they can't even, um, understand like what a protein is, like yeah. why that's important. Why would I have them tracking that and being so scrutinizing themselves that they're not aware of why they need these decisions yet. Right. It's, it's Every, every person has a different skill level and that's okay. That's normal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, there's a greater, a greater message for life, right? We all have a different skill level and, you know, we got, we got to go through those failures and, you know, to be able to learn how to do things best for, for us and the, the way that's successful. The yeah. guideline thing is so powerful. And, you know, you mentioned something that I was kind of chuckling away to myself because as you said, you know, why are we eating? Like, are we, are we tired? Are we maybe overwhelmed, um, maybe anxious? Uh, welcome to the world of being a parent. Um, <laughs> is my kid, am I going to keep, am I doing a terrible job? Is my kid going to survive? Um, I'm yeah. overwhelmed because there's 800 things to do. I'm also tired because, you know, the average parent is sleep deprived for seven years or something ridiculous like that. So yes, yeah. all those things are going to happen and we're going to be mindless sometimes in the way we eat, which I find myself doing and many of you know our members do. Something else that is really important, you know, in this, in what you said is we have to be able to find those guidelines and adapt to those guidelines. And this is really powerful. And what it talks to is, you know, I hear this all the time. Can you just tell me what to eat? Mm -hmm. No, I cannot. Well, I can just tell you what to eat. Yes, but it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and I have this conversation so many times over the years with clients and it's not going to work. And you, you just, you, explained it so well chris in that here's some guidelines adapt to those guidelines so i'm going to give you the guidelines but if you're again if you're not prepared to do the work and and learn and become aware i talk about this with movement all the time with clients i'm like i'm not just going to let you mindlessly do it I'm like you need to understand you need to feel it you need to know why, where you're working why you're working how to feel it where to feel it because otherwise one day i might not be here and, you, and you're going to be back to square one right so it's the same idea you need to build those guidelines build that knowledge and that awareness and and as you so rightfully put the stages of that right some people are ready for a more advanced version of that and some people aren't right some are yeah. at the beginning of that journey so important yeah i mean uh just one last point on this that's, that's why i'm not a big fan of meal plans uh i don't i don't do that I will never do that. There's a time and a place for it. Um, in particular, if I was maybe a medical nutritionist, uh, technically assigning meal plans to people is out of my scope of practice. That's not, I'm not, I shouldn't be doing that. Technically, if I'm trying to help someone lose weight for a medical, re that's out of my scope of practice. The other side of it is the only time I would maybe divide up calories between meals and write something out like that, like a meal plan. That is the type of meal planning you can do as a uh, nutritionist, which technically I am. Uh, you could divide up your, like macronutrients pace per meal. Per meal, you want to have this many mac, this many carbs, this many protein, this many fat per meal, three days, uh, three meals a day, six meals a day, whatever it is, would be if someone was like a physique competitor or like an actor 
or a model who had to look a specific way for their job, I will never work with someone like that. It's, and I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean it as in like, I personally, as a coach, don't want to. I don't want to because it's really messy and really hard and really complicated. And I happen to enjoy working with someone who, who just wants to move better or someone who wants to have a little more balance within their life. As you move up the rungs of the ladder, there's a cost. And it's my job as a coach to make someone aware of the cost. Now, could I help someone do that? Sure. But once someone's 5% body fat or for, for the female identifying folks out there, someone who's like 12, uh, let's say like 14, 15% body fat, you can't maintain that. You just can't. There's a lot that goes into that. And also sometimes when you get to be that size, unfortunately, any other size, suddenly you're comparing yourself to when you were that size. And that's when some of the disordered behaviors can happen. Um, so it depends. It really, it really depends. And that's why I don't, I, I will not be assigning meal plans to anyone. Also, it's the old adage of teacher man had a fish or teach a person how to fish and they will eat a lifetime. You know, it's, it's, I'd rather teach you the skills to be able to make those decisions for yourself for the rest of your life. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's so important. And you know, we we definitely align on a lot of those those values around coaching, um, which I really appreciate. And side note on that with the uh the <laughs> trying to maintain five percent body fat or whatever it might be. The other thing that no one talks about, which I found out, and especially when I moved to Canada, is it's absolutely freezing when you're under 10% body fat in the winter. I tried to stay under 10% all winter long, and it's so cold. Like, no, I'm, I'm definitely up in calories all winter <laughs> long. I need a layer to keep me warm. That's what it's meant to do, people. The fat's meant to insulate, keep you warm. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, that was something that, that I, I found out. It was very harsh. I had to buy lots of extra clothes. Um, yeah. So one thing I'd love to just lean on a little bit here, because I think this is really important. And, it, and it, it is for me, especially with lots of weight loss challenges through my life and growing up in the fitness industry when, there really wasn't many certifications. There wasn't a lot, period, going on then. You know, we kind of learned as we went in the, you know, the the late nineties when I started, and the that diet culture. The you know there was a lot of really the only people talking about it were really the bodybuilders and the weight loss people, right? It was weight loss clubs, it was bodybuilders, and there wasn't a lot in between. That as we heard today has moved on, and there's many other bits of it. What I found happened for me is I started with. I started creating disordered behaviors, as you mentioned, and habits around food. I had them already. <laughs> then what happened was I changed them and just created new ones, but they were with the goal of losing weight. And then I just continued on this journey and every kind of thing I've done, whether it be healthy, be what the fitness professional does or what somebody does is they're trying to be lean or whatever it might be. All the things you mentioned already is it, it for me, just continued to create disordered behaviors. And what I've realized in the last three or four years is I have to find a way of, of, of finding an, an orderly behavior around food, which has been really challenging. What I'd love to do, we spoke a lot about calories. And the reason I brought that up is because a lot of people will have disordered habits around counting of calories, right? And tracking that. Mm -hmm. So what I'd love to sh for you to share a little bit is what do you do when you're in a situation, Chris, where somebody does have that disordered habit around counting calories and you can see as a coach that yeah. it's, if you get them doing it, it's going to bring that back or make it worse or whatever yeah. what would be some skills maybe that anyone listening that might be in that situation could use instead totally yeah calorie counting is i i have a love hate relationship with it uh i i like it because it can help someone be aware of how much they are truly consuming right and usually when someone hates it it's because Generally, if someone isn't disordered and maybe they just hate it, it's because they've never really done it. Um, that is part of it because it's something new and it can be scary. Um, but I wouldn't launch in and have someone do that, even if they are in that category. The way I do it, and this is something I've just kind of developed that really leads its way, is I teach someone that having some form 
of accountability or some form of tracking can be a really powerful tool and a data metric. What happens often is we get wrapped up in this idea that unless I'm hitting a specific number or doing a specific thing, I'm failing, right? Right, that, that's what happens. It's an excessive expectation. If someone has a disordered behavior, we don't have to use calorie counting. What, what I like to do is I call it, <laughs> for the gents I work with, they prefer this name. Uh, I call it an F squared log, but it really is a food and feelings log. It's like a food journal. And the way it really works is you write down what time you're eating, what you're eating. Uh, you don't even have to write how much of it you're eating. You just, if that's where we are right now. And then you write what you were doing before you ate, what you were feeling before you ate, and how you felt after you ate. The reason why is because usually when we aren't tracking at all, someone will come to me and they will say, you know, I'm not eating that much and yet I'm still, I can't lose weight. I think we need to like reduce my calories or something. Or they might've been told by someone that they're in starvation mode, which is my favorite thing that people say. Uh, and to be honest, the client or the person, you're not, you're not wrong. You're not dumb. You're not doing anything wrong because quite frankly, it's because we just don't understand we, you're, you're learning this, so I'm going I'm to lay it out this way. If you aren't losing weight and you are convinced you're in a calorie deficit, you're not in a calorie deficit. Starvation mode is a thing, but it only exists within people who are below 5% body fat and their body stops them from losing weight because they will die if they lose any more weight. You never see someone, you never see someone who's actually starving who is overweight. Like you, you will never see that. And it makes me really sad when people throw that around as a fear-mongering way to tell people that dieting is a bad thing or, or that they need to cut their calories, uh, increase, increase their calories a lot or that X or Y. The reality is you're having a hard time adhering because, yeah, you might be in too big of a deficit. Um, or you might, you, you might be eating a ton of things you're not aware of. So since we're talking to parents right now, every time you eat something off your kid's plate, Every time you add sauces to things, every time you add oils to stuff, every time you grab a handful of Skittles or M&Ms off your coworker's desk, unfortunately, those still count. And I'm not saying this in a bad or good way, but that's usually where the calories come from that we're unaware of. Um, so it's really important to understand that calories, everything is a snack in between a meal. If you're eating your meal, awesome. Everything you're eating in between a meal, when you grab something, when you add a sauce to something, when you do X or Y to something, it's a snack. And that's usually what trips folks up. And then when we talk more about it, folks don't realize they're doing it or when they're doing it or why they're doing it. So if we can begin to uncover that, we can look at these series of events. And since, since you're learning about precision nutrition, what they might call is this is called the, the breaking of the chain. There's a chain of events. And if I look at someone, Timmy Bob, and Timmy Bob tells me he's having uh, five Krispy Kreme donuts like every other day. And he might say, I'm really, I'm really a bad person because I'm eating these Krispy Kreme donuts. The old version of me, like the old Chris, like 22-year-old Chris, brand new coach would be like, yeah, you know, you're just, you're just we just got to cut out that food. Great. Whatever person would cut this out and they would replace it with something else. So it's not actually the food that's the problem. It's the calorie surplus, sure, but still that's not it either because we can get this person to be whatever weight they want to be and there will always still be something that pops up. What it actually is, is what's ever causing that to happen, which is usually an emotional thing. It's usually, uh, okay, those, if, if someone keeps a food and feelings log, you can see, okay, I ate I ate five donuts. What was I doing before? I had a really hard meeting with my boss and I'm not, I'm not delivering the KPIs I'm supposed to be delivering. And I, I was threatened to lose my job or I was belittled in this meeting or I really missed out on this client and I, I was reamed out. Oh, okay. So it's not that I, I'm really addicted to sugar, which is not a thing. It's not that I'm, I have no willpower because that's not a thing. It's not willpower. It's that 
I'm dealing emotionally by eating a bunch of donuts. Cool. Let's look at options that we can do when those sorts of events happen. And what we're doing is we're breaking the chain of events. We're going to what starts the event and finding a different way to regulate that event. This is called obstacle planning. When we have an obstacle and we actually plan a way to deal with the obstacle, we are more likely to be successful than if we just say, ah, it's never going to happen. You need to plan for those obstacles. So what does that look like? Um, there are some great options. Everyone's going to be different. I encourage my clients to figure this out on their own, and then we test it out to see if it works. But some options for your listeners could be going for a walk, could be going and getting a glass of water. It could be calling a loved one. It could be listening to a podcast. It could be reading a book. It could be solving a puzzle. It could be doing Wordle. It could be, it could be uh, playing with a dog or a pet. It could be playing with your kids. It could, do you see what it is? It's obstacle planning. It's a way that you can coexist with the emotion or feeling that you are having. Because at no point did I say it's a way for you to ignore the feeling you're having because you trying to ignore it is actually what led to the five Krispy Kremes. Yeah. Right? I'm chasing, I, I want to get past this feeling. Krispy Kreme donuts, for me, when I was a kid, my dad used to bring home donuts and we'd eat them together. That always is a happy memory for me. If I'm feeling really sad or freaked out or frustrated right now, the Krispy Kreme donut is going to take me closer to being happy. It's a very layered, it's a very layered thing. And a food and feelings log is a way to begin to notice those things and then obstacle plan and then test it out. And you're like, hey, I only ate two donuts this week. That's rad. Or, hey, I only ate two donuts after that after that hard conversation. Well, you ate five last week. You ate two this week. That's so freaking amazing. And people will often say, but you still ate donuts. Yeah, of course, they still ate donuts, but they ate less than they ate before. And they're starting to learn how to do other options besides just going straight for the thing. That, that's how I would implement something. Some form of tracking is really good because it's the only way you can know if what you're doing is actually working. Uh, and even, even the studies that are out there for, for people who have maintained weight loss for longer than like five years, they still weigh themselves. They do some form of macro tracking. They still do strength training. They still walk daily. They still have some form of accountability within their life. All of those things, like they still have a community within their life. Like all of those things are really important and you can just view them as data points. You don't have to view them as I'm attached to this number X or Y. And it takes a while to get there. And that's why working with a coach or someone who specializes in something like this or going to therapy, like they're all so powerful. Um, they have been for my client. They have been for me. It, it, it's, just, it's just a part of it. Emotional regulation is such a big part of it. And as a coach, it's your responsibility if you're a coach and you're listening out there to, to be better informed. And you can do that by reading books, by listening to podcasts, by asking questions. Yeah, yeah, being curious. Um, yeah, I love that. I think that's so so important for people to hear that we can we can continue to have those data points. And how I kind of talk to this sometimes with movement, with with you know lifestyle, nutrition, everything in that kind of realm is it's it's not a test. It's not a pass or fail test. Like that's not how it works, right? Yeah. It, you're not going to fail. And and you know you you mentioned the good and the bad today, which I think is really important. We're speaking to you know us as parents, but you know think about that that knock on effect to, to the children we're raising too is, you know, when things are good and bad, we start to attach this like moral, our moral being to that. And, you know, we did, you know, something was bad and then you're bad as opposed to this is just part of that journey you're on. You know, was it optimal? Maybe not, but you know, it's part of life, right? You know, and, you know, we talk to that, you know, we try and talk to that in our house. I, you know, I talk to my clients about these things. So yeah, I love, I love that. It's not, it's those, it's those guidelines. It's not the hard, fast, and, you know, and I'm on the same page as you. Anything that really enforces that hard, fast rule, that fail, fail or pass kind of mentality on stuff is, and this is from experience, is it doesn't work. You only have to look at, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call it out because why not? Because we can do what we want, really. I mean, it's a podcast. Is look at the biggest loser. It's a hard, fast set of rules. It's a fail or a pass. Where are all those people right now? Back where they started for the most part right? Because it's that there's, there's no, they're not informed. 
There's no guidelines being taught. It's hard and fast. It's pass and fail. They walk out the door, it comes back, right? So it, it is that cycle that so many people get in. So I, I love that, you know, we can empower people by this conversation and, and, you know, with all that great information you shared, I love it. Um, look, from a standpoint of a, you are a coach, you run your own business, you're a busy parent, um, parenting comes with many obstacles, as we discussed before we recited recording. <laughs> Um, there's many things going on and, you know, we, we spoke about that emotional thing where, you know, we are, you know, we have a stressful bedtime, we go downstairs and we snack because we're stressed and we're emotional, whatever it might be. We all go through this. What are some of the, I'd like, you know, to kind of start to, to wrap up, I want you to share some of your favorite kind of strategies. What do you use in your household to just mount it like your own personal, your nutrition, but also kind of the family as well. And, you know, we don't have yeah. to be too specific. We don't want to tell anyone how to do it, but I think we no, always no, love no. to hear how you do it. Sure. Uh, I'll start off first with, with, with kids. This is what I've come to find. Uh, we just find that eating what we eat is what he eats. There's no special meals. There's no special prepared anything. It's just what our pediatrician told us and what really works. Does he eat all the time? Absolutely not. He's a toddler. I'm lucky if some days he finishes an entire meal. Yeah. But the second you look at your kid and you say, okay, you're not eating enough. Can you eat more? Are you hungry? Do you want more of this? Are you going to eat more of this? And you keep prodding them. That's not doing a great thing for their, for their relationship with food. Because, I, you know, my wife, I, I have to give her so much credit. She's such an amazing human being. And she does all this research. And there, there are folks who literally like, this is their job. They specialize in like, parenting coaching and kid coaching and their psychologists and all this stuff. And like, you're literally damaging, unfortunately, their relationship with food by telling them like, Hey, you can't leave the table unless you eat this or that. You can't do those sorts of things were what I was told as a kid. And it made me feel, it made me feel like there was something wrong. Sometimes if I was kids know when they're full, kids won't starve. If you are putting food in front of them, always having something on the table that they enjoy eating is a nice way to kind of to kind of work with that. We always have um, blueberries or raspberries or sweet potato or um, cheese. Like those are the things we always have close by. If he's if he's like I don't, he'll say fruit. Like if he doesn't want any more, we usually just put the fruit on the plate with the rest of the food. And guess what? He ends up eating the rest of the food. It's just it's just how kids work. It's, this is how my son works. I don't know if it's how everyone else's kid works. But yeah, we don't do special meals. Like that's not a thing. Um, the other thing we do is we eat together as a family. Um, and what I mean by this is like when my wife can be there because she, she is a teacher, she is a choreographer, she works crazy hours. I happen to work from home. I, I, I have more adjustable hours. Uh, one to two days a week is, is just daddy TJ time. Uh, we sit down and eat our meals together. I'm not on my phone during a meal. We have a no phone at the table rule. We eat together. We put on his favorite songs. We sing to those songs together. We joke around. When it's our entire family, my son gets so excited. Uh, when it's my in-laws, when it's my mom, when it's tea, he gets so excited. Kids are looking for that connection. Meals are meant to be shared. They're not meant to be like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about work only I'm doing. And for parents, it's if, if we're not disconnected from our phones, which is really hard to do, and you can build up to this skill. But if we're attached to our phones during meals, or we're looking at screens, we're more likely to overeat and more likely to eat at the next meal. There's a whole research. Uh, I can't even remember the, the, the name of it, but there was a group where they looked at individuals who were blind and they found that those individuals uh, ate more at the next meal because they couldn't actually see what they were eating. Uh, they also, they also found that, um, people, people with amnesia would also, they could eat a delicious meal, think it was delicious, but because they had some sort of brain injury, they would forget that they ate and they would eat more. So there's psychological connection to our meal. If we're not looking, acknowledging taste, texture, um, uh, flavors, if we're not doing any of that, we're more likely to overconsume at the next meal or to snack between meals. It's just... It's just what it is. And giving yourself a fighting chance by limiting screen time or putting the phone in airplane mode just for that meal makes a huge difference for you, but also for your kid. 
Um, and that's hard to do. So don't try to just, as soon as you hear this, if you're like, oh no, I'm a horrible. No, you're not. You're human. And the reason why you're on the phone is probably because you're trying to be able to pay for all the groceries. So what you can try and do is on the weekends, try to have one meal where you don't have your phone. Then during the week, try to have one meal where you don't have your phone. And then when you're consistent with that, do two meals. And then when you're consistent with that, do three meals. That's how you build up to be able to do that. Um, so those are some of the things with my kid. For me personally, um, I just try to be aware of how much I'm having. I'm not a big snacker anymore. When I was younger, I'm still relatively young, uh, but when I was younger, I would eat all day, every day, didn't matter. I was trying really, really hard to put on some muscles. So I'd be like, I gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat, gotta eat double lunch, gotta eat X or Y. I just focus really, really hard. And so does my wife too, on eating enough protein. This is so helpful because protein helps maintain lean muscle mass. It helps with recovery between training sessions. If someone is losing weight, ideally we want to retain lean muscle mass. We don't want to burn through that. Also, it's incredibly filling. It's, it's incredibly filling. Usually what happens is if we don't pay attention to our protein intake and we're really, really low on protein, like all the time, we tend to be hungry more frequently between meals, especially if we're not paying attention to part two, which is the uh, fiber dense or nutrient dense, like fruits and vegetables we have within our diet. So those are two big things that we really try to focus fiber and protein um, and building balanced plates. So when you focus on those things, it becomes a lot easier and actually less time consuming. And actually you find that you're actually eating way more um, there are things that are technically lower in calories, technically more filling and satisfying, and your snacking goes down because you're actually full. Most people tend to eat more because they're not full, and that makes sense. Um, so really focusing on your protein intake is really important. And I was vegan vegetarian for like two and a half years. I still tried to focus on my protein intake. There are tons of other plant-based alternatives that you can use. So I'm not just talking about meat eaters. I'm talking about anyone. Um, and we think we could probably do a whole podcast on that in and of itself, but there are tons of other alternatives out there for you. And it's just important that you're aware. So for someone in that category, this is what I had to do. Um, I would track, I, I used chronometer. You can use my fitness pal. I would just do it so I could see how much I was having a specific of protein. Um, because that's so easy to miss out on what I have all clients do now is, um, hand portions. So for me, my size, I try to get at least two, two to three palmfuls of protein at each meal. If I don't, I usually have one to two protein shakes during the day. It's just, it's just for me staying full. I sleep better at night. I, I perform better in the gym. I, I have a better ability to concentrate. Those are the things that I really focus on. And probably um, I've accepted that I will eat after 8 p.m., uh, that's normal. Uh, you don't, you don't look, there's this myth that you will get fat. If you eat after like seven, 8 PM, it's BS. It's, it's just there to make you afraid to eat. If you're truly hungry, eat a meal, have a protein dense snack late at night. I, I usually have Greek yogurt or cottage cheese with fruit or Greek yogurt mixed with a protein powder and fruit. My blood sugar is fine. I'm type one diabetic. It's like, I'll tell you, your blood sugar will be fine. Um, that protein in Greek yogurt or cottage cheese has casein protein in it. It breaks down slower over the night. That's why folks will have eggs at night sometimes too, because it's slow digesting. You're more likely to be full, less likely to wake up super hungry, less likely to overconsume at breakfast sometimes. Like it's, it's this cycle. Um, people who do gain weight eating late at night, it's usually because they're eating because they're not hungry and they're eating highly palatable things uh, later in the evening to try and keep themselves awake because they're tired. Uh, so that's a different conversation too. But you can eat after 8 p.m. You won't gain weight if you do. Uh, calories in, calories out, still counts. <laughs> I love that. That's like the perfect place to wrap up the show. Calories in and calories out. It's, it's like that. I talk about the, the hierarchy 
of, uh, of anything like when it comes to exercise and nutrition and, and that's the that is the base of that right like if you think of it like a pyramid this is it the foundation everything else is of a lesser importance if you like than that one thing so yeah i think that's such a, a great place to uh to kind of bring the show to an end thank you for sharing that stuff um i love it when we get some kind of personal things that you do I, again i love that we align on many things you know eating the same meals as a family no phones at the table just little things that i've picked up that that make a big impact on your kids and, and to your family life and it makes the the meal time a, a special moment rather than just another thing to tick off the list in your house so uh, i like that and it's made a big difference to us so appreciate you sharing that um Listen, as always, I get so much for these conversations. So, Chris, I appreciate your time, your knowledge and everything coming on the show, you know, sharing all this great information that I know people are going to um, get a lot from. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's a yeah. pleasure. Of course. Hey, everyone listening, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I know that you would have picked up some incredible information today. And um, listen, if you want to connect with Chris, I'm going to put everything in the show notes. So you'll be able to connect with him on social media. His website will be in there. So you'll be able to just reach out if you've got questions, if you want to, you know, any information, if you want to find out about what Chris is doing with his coaching online, then definitely do that because, you know, that's what we're here to do. Support each other, support the world of health and fitness and, you know, make as big a difference as possible and share the podcast with someone you love and care about. Uh, that's it for today's show. Again, thank you for listening, Chris. Thank you for your time. And we will catch you all on the next episode.